Uh, and there's also calls for pensioners to be charged national insurance to help pay for social care, as, uh, as if pensioners have not paid into the system long enough. And indeed, having also now been hit by Rachel Reeves' revelations that uh, many of them are now going to lose their winter field allowance, which of course is something that Rachel Reeves previously, in the run-up to the election, said would not happen. So the first U-turn for this Labour government, uh, only about 28 days into being in Downing Street. Well, look, let's talk about that particular issue now, pensioners national insurance, with Sir Steve Webb, who is a former pensions minister. Sir Steve, thank you very much for joining me on Talk. Hello, Russell. Good afternoon. Yeah, hi. Good afternoon. Um, now, I know that this isn't fact yet. It is not something that is absolutely going to happen. Uh, it's been suggested as something that uh, uh, should potentially take place uh, by uh, a government advisor, uh, that it would actually fill part of the gap in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the issues around paying for care. Um, but it would stick in the throat, wouldn't it, of pensioners, the fact that not only have they probably not recovered, but now reeling still from the fact that they're going to lose, some of them, their winter fuel allowance. But the prospect here, potentially, where it's being recommended to Rachel Rees that they should also be subject to national insurance on earnings as a pensioner, that surely is a bridge too far, isn't it? I think you added an important point there, which is on earnings, and obviously most pensioners have no earnings. So we're not talking about someone who's 80 or 90 or whatever suddenly having an extra tax bill. I guess what we will be talking about, and this is an idea from a chap called Sir Andrew Dilmart, who wrote the big report on social care that was going to cap care costs and that's been dropped. And he's kind of saying, well, where's the money going to come from? Yes. And I suppose his argument is, you know, let me give you an example. There will be members of parliament who are over pension age who don't pay national insurance on their wage and a younger MP does pay national insurance on their wage. And I guess the question would be, if they're on the same wage, why should they pay different amounts? So, you know, so it's it's about wages, it's not about pensions. Well, it's but, not but about the, the answer would be because that particular person has probably paid into the system for 50 years of their working life. Indeed, and if we were in a world where we didn't have a very dramatically ageing population where particularly health and social care needs are just going to skyrocket and that money does have to come from somewhere, so we could just say when we've retired, we've paid in all our lives, that's the end of it, you know, it all ought to go on the working population. But I guess there comes a point where the working age population say, well, hang on a minute, when today's pensioners were working, they didn't have to pay as much tax as we are going to have to pay now. So there is a an intergenerational fairness the other way, I think. If you load all of it on the working population, well, is that fair? Because, you know, you'll have to pay for today's pensions, today's social care, today's well, health care and so on. Let's be honest, I suspect that it's going to be both of those things. It's yes, going to be I national insurance right. on pensioners' earnings, uh, entirely unacceptably and inappropriately from my point of view, plus extra tax on uh, working people. Uh, and yes, Rachel, is even ordinary working people. It's going to be both, isn't it? There, there is another way, of course, of governments finding more money, uh, and that's just to be more efficient. And you hear this all the time, and I think, you know, of course, big organisations can be inefficient. On the other hand, what tends to happen when you get these efficiency drives is that you get, often you get false economies. So, you know, you, you sack, say you sack people, and then when the public ring up on a call line to the DWP or something like that, they can't get through, so they ring again, and then eventually they get through, and the person who's on isn't as well trained, so they then have to ring back again because there aren't as many skilled people. And before you know it, you've got the headline, great, we've cut, and then actually the service you provide gets worse, and it's often, you know, just sacking people doesn't make government more efficient. I mean, yes, let's use AI and all those kind of things. There is potential here. Um, but, the, you know, if there was cheap, easy fixes, they'd have done it long ago. But, but I, I guess that the whole premise of national insurance is, is that it was a carved out tax specifically for the purposes of care and, and, and I guess the, the National Health Service, but, but specifically for care. So. I guess we can understand and be sympathetic to pensioners listening to this that have paid in all their lives, thinking, well, hang on a sec, I, I, we started paying national insurance back in whenever it was, the 1950s, I think, specifically to pay for our care. Now what this government's saying is that that's not enough and we've got to continue to pay, despite the fact that we thought we were signing up for that only whilst we, uh, you know, before we retired. Um, so so, so that, yeah. that's, that's, a, that's understandably 
irritating from the point of view of the country's millions of pensioners. What one would be forgiven for thinking, though, that pensioners are being bashed here by this government already, only 30 days in. And I'm not, by the way, asking you to be an apologist for the Labour Party, because, of course, you were a Liberal Democrat minister, yeah. weren't you, in the coalition. Um, so I'm not asking you to be an apologist for them, but there's clearly something going on here where the Labour government seem to think that pensioners are easy game. I guess there's two things. I mean, first of all, national insurance was never about care. When national insurance was created, it was about pensions. It's the national insurance pension. It was about pensions and national insurance benefits. A fraction went to the NHS and so on. But, you know, to be honest, in 1948, when it was created, nobody had social care. You know, we all used to just die, basically. We didn't have long, lingering old ages. So, so national insurance was never about care. Care is a new cost. Bluntly, we're living longer. We're able. It's great. We're able to keep people alive for longer. But for many people, you know, I've got family members at the moment. You know, in in residential care, you know, the costs are enormous. That money has to come from somewhere. And if you load it all on the working age population, I don't think that's fair. Whether this is the right answer specifically is debatable. Yeah, and what's the but, gap that you yeah. talked about earlier on? So th th there is obviously an increasing gap, particularly as you know the birth rate is decreasing. People yeah. are living longer. So so that gap in terms of uh, young people effectively now having to fuel that increased care cost. That, that's an absolute fact. I mean, that, that, there's nothing we can do about that. That is what it is. What, what is that gap now and what does it kind of increase to, do you think, over the next 10 or 20 years or so in financial terms? Yeah, sure. I mean, when you look at the share of our national income going on things like the health service and on social care, those are the things that are exploding. It's not, funny enough, it's not pensions. It is our health. You know, that I think about my, my parents' generation in the late 80s, early 90s, they're constantly using the health service, increasingly needing social care. And that turns into, I mean, it, it's tens of billions of pounds. It almost, it's, it's, it's funny money. It's kind of hard to make any sense of. Mm. But essentially, it just means higher taxation as a whole on all of us. And I guess what I would say on your point about pensioners is, yes, nobody wants to lose £200, £300 a week going to fuel payment. Of course they don't. And there's a question about how honest people were before the election on that. But alongside that, you've got the triple lock on the state pension for the next five years, which is a very substantial, costly benefit and, and a real political football of course as we've yeah. seen from yeah. both the conservatives and labor in terms of their campaigning over the last uh, few months or so that's right but it's, it does mean that there is money set aside for a growth in the real value of the state pension for another five years which which is also I, all i would say is i think you've got to see these things in the round of course and individual measures on the popular on the person it affects yeah. but 300 quid on wind fuel once a year as against a decent pension over indexed yeah. You know, it's not but, but, but it's think, not hammering pensioners in my I th view. I think, well, but pensioners will also say, uh, and let me speak, I'm not quite a pensioner yet, but let me speak on behalf of pensioners, if you like, I've got a few years to go, uh, is that the choices that politicians make are indeed choices. So when it comes yes. to, let's say, the trillion pounds that comes into the Treasury every year from taxation, um, politicians are empowered with a choice as to what they do with that money. Now, they could decide not to... Uh, be quite so enthusiastic about this quest for net zero. They could decide not to give doctors a 22% pay rise over the next two years, or indeed teachers and nurses an inflation-busting 5.5% pay rise. They could decide not to give £11 billion to other countries to help them, not us, but them, with their so-called climate change dilemmas. We could cut the foreign aid budget, Steve. We could do a lot of things that would actually prevent pensioners from being disadvantaged here. Why don't we do those things? I mean, as you might imagine, I, I profoundly disagree on a number of those suggestions. But but the, the point is, we just come out of an election manifesto where anybody but Labour's already saying, ripped up. Like Labour have already gone back well, on. Well, I mean, four weeks was, in. Come on, there have. was nothing in the Labour manifesto that said we'll cut aid, we'll cut net zero. Rachel and all of that. Reeves they, specifically they, said that she would not cut the week. Well, the exactly, and, and people voted for a whole manifesto of things yeah i mean i agree with you on the interfuel payment they should not have implied or said before the election they wouldn't get rid of it and then means tested after i agree with you entirely agree with you on that but in the grand scheme of the you know you mentioned a trillion odd quid of tax revenue you know the winter fuel measure will save one and a half billion it is it is quite a small change in the grand scheme of all these big choices that you rightly say so, we so have why to do it I mean, well, politically, of, politically, yeah. it's suicide. I mean, OK, it's well, not because we're four and a half years away from the next yeah. election. And, and yeah. I guess, look, politicians being politicians, and I, I say this with no disrespect to you as a former one, but they think that in four and a half years, all of these tough decisions that are made at the beginning of a parliament will be forgotten. I mean, that's partly what's going on here. 
it, it is common to make the most difficult decisions right at the start. And I guess in answer to your question, well, why why do it if it's not that much? Is because often you need a lot of different measures to add up to a decent amount of money. There isn't usually just one thing you can do that will raise you all the tens of millions. No, that but you they're need. political choices. They're ideological choices. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, yeah, I, I won't be sidetracked into climate change and all that kind of thing but i mean the goal the, the big goal of all of this is to get the economy going to generate the growth and if they can do that and that's the big gamble of all of this if they can do that then you get the tax revenue coming in then you can spend money improving the health service and, and i would say as a pensioner you really really want a well-funded health service mm. you know, I, I, I far think more, you know. Of course, of course they do. But but again, I, I don't think it's it, it's not kind of binary. I think there are there's a, a there's a version of the way that the treasury cake is cut that doesn't have to disadvantage, particularly pensioners that uh, you know have put the hard yards in, haven't they, over many many years. Um, so I, I think this is being very unfair and disrespectful to those. I, I could wager, of course, that the Labour Party think that actually pensioners might be slightly more likely to vote for the Conservatives or reforms, so therefore they're easy game. Well, it's certainly true that when you move from a party for the last 14 years whose vote is very heavily skewed towards older people to the opposite, inevitably that's going to be fed through into policies. And that, you know, I think that is right. And that's that's almost w why we're seeing some of what we're seeing. I mean, but there are, I, all I'd say is you've got to see this in the round. I mean, think about falling interest rates. So the Bank of England have just cut interest rates. Everyone assumes interest rates are now coming down. That's actually bad news if you're a saver so yeah. for all the people that's bad news it's good news if you've got a mortgage so good you know so that policy is good news for younger people the winter fuel payment maybe on the other hand the triple lock's good for older people so all those things you can't just pick one policy and say it's a savage attack on pensioners because it just ain't it's the whole package of measures you've got to look at it's a holistic thing uh, one more question before you go it's entirely unrelated to the subject why, why didn't the liberal democrats do better in the general election steve well, I guess what was I mean, it, seventy-two. Can, can I just sorry? Let me just let me just qualify. Yeah. yeah, you did much much better than previously, but yes. you know, we we had a Conservative government and a Conservative party in tatters, a Labour party that people generally didn't trust, and I think now we're seeing that that was for good reason. Uh, people that voted Labour actually were stayed at home because they were objecting to the Conservative government rather than wanting to vote Labour. Surely the Liberal Democrats should have come up through the middle, and you should have ended up with two two hundred and fifty MPs, shouldn't you? I guess, I mean, two thoughts, really. I mean, one is 72 MPs is more than the third party's had since about 1920 or something. So kind of, you know, give them a break kind of thing. But I, I think the real challenge is in probably 450 seats, it was Conservative first, Labour second, or the other way around. Mm -hmm. And people on the whole, when they're constant, they're strongly anti the incumbent government, work out who's the best person to get them out. And to be heard, you know, for a Lib Dem party, who weren't even the third party in the House of Commons, to be heard in all of that just was incredibly difficult. You know, the, if you were going to do a media story, you'd do the government, the rebel on the government side, the main opposition party, maybe the Scots Nats, maybe Nigel Farage. Do you want the sixth perspective from the Lib Dems? You know, it's very hard to be heard, really. Maybe if Ed Davey, if Sir Ed Davey, hadn't spent quite so much time falling out of kayaks <laughs> and on roller coasters, you might have done even better. You wouldn't have covered him at all if you hadn't done that. <laughs> no, that, you, you're probably right. Um, no, no, of course we would. We would have given him very, uh, a, a very even keel. Uh, so Steve Webb, uh, former pensions minister, thank you very much indeed for joining me. 